All right, all right. Go ahead and grab a seat. Love to see that conversation keep going. Okay, now, now we enter into our time of teaching at Sedaris. We do this every week. Uh, we are community rooted in the scriptures. We believe that God has revealed himself through the word. So we come and we do a time of teaching each and every week. Um, and we hope it's always substantial, weighty, that it presses in on you, that it stirs your soul to affection for Christ. And I have no doubt that that's going to happen again today because one of my friends, mentors, he was actually a youth pastor when I was just a lad. You're going to see him and you're going to see like, this guy looks good. How could he have been a youth pastor when this old man was a kid? Um, and he has planted a church and now he is moved into a time of ministry. Um, well, let me tell you this. If you've got the weekly email, you may have read it, just the subject line. I, I, I realize that many people don't read my emails. <laughs> and you saw the subject line and it said, uh, Confessions of an Uber Pastor. And you probably thought, look at Dave, boasting again. <laughs> the Uber Pastor. <laughs> no. I'm actually referencing Pastor Jason Turner, who now his ministry is to, uh, he's involved in a ride-sharing uh, organization called Uber. Have you heard of it? And he drives for, so that he can minister to the people of our city. So uh, he, you can follow him on Instagram at Uber Pastor and uh, hear about stories from the field as he gets to interact with our city and drive for our city. And it's just fantastic. So I'm not speaking about myself, though I have many a confession. It is not about me. Uh, it is about Jason Turner, and I'd like to invite him up right now. Jason, would you come on up? Uh, I'm going to pray for him as he begins the time of teaching for us. So Jason, let me pray for you, and uh, then we'll let you do what you do. All right. Father God, thank you for this man of God who you have called into your service in, in many ways over his years in ministry, God, and just as a human being. We just, we're just so thankful to know him. I thank you for the mentor that he is in my life, the encouragement he gives to me on a weekly basis, God. And uh, We just pray now that you'd fill him with your spirit as he delivers to us your words, anything that is from you, God, may it stir in our soul. And those things that may not be from you, may it go in one ear and out mm. the other. We yes. pray now, God, for your power to come through your word and through this man. In Jesus' name, mm. amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, David. Well, good morning, Sedaris. <laughs> oh, wow. Good morning, Sedaris. Good morning. There we go. That's way better. I have known David uh, a long time, and I will tell you, of all the students um, that I've had a chance to minister to and, 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 and shepherd, like David was never on the radar, um, <laughs> to pastor a church. <laughs> so he has most definitely been called of the Lord. Um, and, and I say that sort of tongue-in-cheek, but I, I, I mean that. I mean, he is called. And you guys as a church are very blessed. And of course, when you have a guest speaker, they're supposed to say things of that nature. Um, but I believe that. So let me pray for our time. I know David prayed for me. And I'm going to share this morning a little bit about my story and then get into uh, some things that I have learned. Uh, I'm continuing to learn as a, as a missionary, as an ambassador of Christ. This is something that we share. Um, so I just want you to know, like, I'm in this with you. Uh, I love this city. And uh, I believe God uh, has people that he wants to rescue, people that he wants to heal. And we get to be a part of that. So my prayer is that there will be something of this morning that you can take and, and meditate on. And if I offend you... I'm not coming back next week. And so um, really want this to be uh, from God's heart. So let me pray for our time and then we'll just dive in. Let's pray. Father, it is really good to be here this morning. Um, Father, to gather uh, with other uh, believers um, and perhaps those here that are, that are wrestling. Um, Lord, they're, um, they're intrigued. Um, they're curious. And God, I pray that you might uh, speak to them this morning as well. Um, Lord, we know that we're here uh, solely because your ways are unlike ours, because your thoughts are above ours. 
Lord, you are the one that um, has compassion unlike us. In fact, it says uh, in the word that you abundantly pardon. And so, God, we're here because of your mercy and because of your grace. It's undeserved. There is nothing for us this morning to posture about, but simply to be here filled with gratitude. Lord Jesus, would you speak this morning? Would you uniquely minister to your people? Might they experience your presence? And God, we're here this morning desperate to hear your voice. And so I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would fill me and give me unction. And Father, might these words be yours. And um, Lord, that as a result, that you would have done real ministry in our hearts today. It's for your glory and our joy. And all God's people prayed. Amen. All God's people prayed. Okay, okay. We're just, we're like the little engine this morning. Um, Well, I'm going to open the lockbox this morning and uh, just begin and share some things that are personal. And then I'm going to lock it back up. And this is typically, uh, anybody that public speaks, their least favorite thing is usually to talk about themselves. So I, I'm, this is not a habit, but nonetheless. So it was May 2014, and I was out for my daily jog. And returning home, my wife, Julie, she asked me a question, and she said, "Hun, what's wrong? And the question, it puzzled me, um, and I asked her, what are you talking about? And she had passed me in her car on the way home, and she said, "Hun, you aren't jogging, you're shuffling. And I sort of took offense to that, and I'm thinking, I don't shuffle. Like, I'm, I'm running. Well, as it turns out, she was right. I was unaware of what was happening to me, and really from that point, from May 2014 onward, something alarming began to change, manifest in my body, in the muscles of my body. And from that point forward, our family began uh, really an excruciating, somewhat isolating medical journey, um, a three-year medical journey, 15-doctor medical journey to figure out what's going on with Jay. By Christmas of 214, I could hardly climb stairs. My legs were just spent all the time. My lungs were down 25% in capacity. Um, I was losing the ability to use my hands. I couldn't open a bag of chips. Um, Simple tasks. I was dropping things constantly, and my muscles began to twitch, fasciculate 24-7. It would be abnormal for me to sit and not feel that. Some of you know that feeling. You've worked out hard, and maybe a muscle's sort of telling you stop. My whole body was doing that, and um, it just became my normal. I was losing dexterity uh, in my hands. Buttoning a shirt was very difficult. And by January of 215, the fear of a degenerative muscle disease was something doctors began to test for. Lou Gehrig's. And so my world at that moment just, it, it, it instantly shrank and exploded at the same time. And it was almost impossible to remain tethered to the present and to, um, and to people really. Life became very dark uh, for myself and for those that I loved most. And this new reality of of my physical decline really haunted my family for probably a solid two years uh, without reprieve. Felt like I could identify with Jonah. Jonah was really entombed in the belly of a fish in a space of darkness, aloneness, and most of my time these two years was spent in bed. Um, I understand. Uh, David shared about lamenting a few weeks back as Tracy uh, had lost her life. And um, as a church learning, I, in this season I learned how to lament and to grieve and to wait. Waiting for a diagnosis, not wanting a diagnosis. 
sitting in the parking lot of the neurologist working up the courage to go in for another test. Would this be the day? Would this be the day? Would this be the day where they will tell me uh, and confirm? Well, God had other plans. And by May of 2016, the doctors took the worst diagnosis off the table. And I regained function in my extremities. They sort of left me in a space of that gray diagnosis of chronic fatigue, which is a clinical diagnosis. We don't know why, but <laughs> you are going to be fatigued. And, um, and I would say God spared my life. He had other plans for me. But through that journey, God gave me two profound gifts. He gave me the gift of repentance, and he also gave me the gift of perspective. The gift of repentance. See, repentance, folks, Sedaris, church, it's a gift. God is the one that grants us repentance. Second Timothy 2.25 tells us this. And during this season of um, this trial, this health crisis, I was forced to face sin in my life that I had not dealt with. I had compartmentalized. Been in ministry for 25 years, done a lot of different things, uh, planted a church. About five years into that project, I began to rely on alcohol as my cistern uh, of shalom, a broken cistern forsaking really the presence of God. And that became my go-to because every day is a stressful day. And, um, and God wanted that area. And I said, no, you can't have that area. I'll manage that area. I wasn't like a raving drunk, but that was my go-to. That's where I found peace. And the Lord wanted that. And the Lord violently took that from me. Um, and so it's a gift. God wanted my character back in alignment with his. And I would say that season of life was what Lewis calls a severe mercy. Um, God reclaimed my heart. You know, it says in Hebrews 12.10, it says that God disciplines us. Why? He disciplines us that we might share in his holiness. It's not arbitrary. It's not vengeance. It's not retribution. God actually wants his kids to look like him. So that's the first gift. And the second gift God gave me in that season was the gift of perspective. Because see, for really the first time in my life, I was forced to face my own mortality. It's very difficult to do so when you are 20 something, 30 something. You feel the vitality of life. Well, I was faced with my own mortality and uh, to be completely honest, I was not ready to meet the Lord. And I spent three sleepless nights just dealing with the Lord one-on-one. -on -one. Have you ever had that experience? Where it's just like your friends are gone, Pastor David's not there to advocate for you, it's just you and the Lord, right? And I, and I had that experience and church... Um, it's, it's frightening and it's wonderful. The Lord gave me the gift of perspective. And I've come through this experience having exchanged really my physical energy for perspective. And if God were to come to me and give me the opportunity to go back, he offered my physical strength back to me, but I would lose that urgency of man's eternity, I would not go back. I would not. Because with perspective, God can do much with us. Perspective is what's fueled this really odd, um, yet wonderful Uber ministry over these last three years. To have a pastor taken from really the, the structure, the, the walls of a church, and then thrust into the marketplace, into the world where you live. It's been so good. Um, 
And so the catalyst for why I began driving, well, uh, by January 2016, my sin, my rebellion, ultimately cost me my church. There's a whole story there. It was a little bit of a delayed reaction, but ultimately, by that time, uh, leadership decided uh, they were better off with somebody else leading. And so I was still in that frame of mind of, man, I don't know what I can do. I don't know how long I've got. I don't, I don't, I don't know my capacity to do much of anything. I was still dealing with massive fatigue. I still am today. So what do I do? When you're a pastor for 25 years, what do you do? I mean, you're in your resume. I teach the Bible. We don't really have a need for that at Amazon. <laughs> so a couple of my friends said, Jay, why don't you start driving for Uber? And I had no, I didn't even know what Uber really was. And so I just started driving. And I've averaged the last three years 50,000 miles on my car. That's a lot of Ubers. Um, that's a lot of conversations. And really what, what started as a job, simply to try to help pay the bills, it really quickly turned into a ministry, an unexpected one. You know, I, I am confronted daily with the lostness of people in our city. And um, something that was theological, it's here now in greater degree. And when that touches you, the, the seriousness of life, of God, of grace, of heaven, everything gets altered. Everything changes. I mean, even for David. That's why you have a pastor. Because 12 years ago, on St. Patrick's Day, he's in a sports bar and gets a phone call and finds out his best friend, or I would say probably your best friend, his older sister had been killed, so he's out in an alley weeping and God's meeting him and redirecting his life your pastor's called sober minded it's so strange we live in a, in, in a place in a time of wit and sarcasm and yet the important this is what it's about so I'm faced with the spiritual state of folks every day. I mean, people need Jesus, church. Amen? People need Jesus, church. Amen? Amen. I mean, heaven is forever. Scripture says we're vapor. We're like grass. We don't even know what tomorrow will hold. And so we've been called to be busy about our master's work today. And so I Uber. <laughs> People need the Lord, so I Uber. And church, I'm not trying to say, I'm not trying to be clever. I'm not trying to have like the new kind of ministry. It's, it's, it's humbling. It's humbling to have two 19-year-old girls in your car speaking down to you. I have a master's of divinity, <laughs> and you should treat me, at, treat me as such. It doesn't go very far. I'm cleaning up vomit. This is, this is not the life, but it's the ministry the Lord has called me to for today. And so I get to share the gospel almost daily, which is remarkable. I answer questions. Um, nothing in my car is off limits. You're angry at God? Tell me about that. You want to talk about suffering? Let's talk about that. You believe more that there's no God as opposed to there being a God? Let's talk about that. This morning, I'm not going to give you tactics so much. If I can come back and do another, we'll see. We'll just see how this goes. But um, I'm there to, to engage, and, and, and people love this church. One person said, you're like, you're like a church on wheels. I said, well, then this counts, man. You're good. You can take Sunday off. I mean, he was already going to take Sunday off. Um, <laughs> but it's become, uh, it's become a place of prayer. I pray with folks all the time. I never did that before. 
It, I don't know. If you pray for your unbelieving neighbors, your friends, your coworkers, but I'll tell you what, man, they love it. You, that may surprise you. I think I've only had in three years one person said, no, that's okay. Most people are like, and I asked, I said, can I pray for you? <laughs> they got a job interview. They have some loss, some sickness. Boyfriend just OD'd on heroin, and they're a mess. I said, can I pray for you? It doesn't matter what. I, I've never had a ministry of prayer. But it's beautiful for people to have a sense when you are serious about God and you intercede for them. Most people have sort of a vague notion about God. But when they meet somebody that knows the living God and then you intercede for them, it's moving to them. I had a couple in town. They were here for a funeral. And we got to where I was going to drop them off. They didn't even know I was a pastor. I don't lead with, hey, hey, I'm Pastor Jay. I don't do that. Uh, It eventually comes up most of the time. But... I just, we got there and said, hey, man, can I pray for you guys? And they're like, yeah. So I prayed. They began to weep. And the, and the man, as he was getting out, said, I wasn't expecting that. But that was, that's what we needed. I'll pray for anything. I had a fella going out on a, on a Tinder date. Um, Tinder, Bumble, Bagel, Hinge, whatever. Uh, and... And it was a Monday night, because Monday nights are Tinder dates, night, because, right, you don't want to waste a good night on a bad date. So uh, Mondays and Tuesdays are typically those sorts of dates. And we talk, we're talking about romance, we're talking about the whole dating scene that is just so bankrupt. Um, and men generally suck. We'll talk about this next time you invite me back. I'll, t- I'll share with you more about that. But um, I love men. I mean, I love my wife, but I mean, I'm going to stop talking. I don't know where this is going. The point is, I, I pray for this fella. I said, can I pray for you? He's like, uh, yeah, I guess. Because we had been talking about, man, just he was tired of it, tired of it. I said, you know what? I'm going to pray. And I prayed. I said, Lord, let this be this man's last first date. Let this be the one. I think he was shocked a bit, but he was like, that was so cool. And I think even though probably his objective was to sleep with this gal that night, he was feeling a little bit more gravity (laughs) of perhaps what was taking place. So I get a chance to to pray with folks. I have resources. I give out my contact information. If people want to follow up, grab coffee. I have books. And really, my aim is just to put a pebble in a person's shoe. It's really a ministry of considering. David planted a church. I drive a car. It's the same ministry. I mean, we want folks to consider, to be thoughtful. And this is what has surprised me in this sort of Uber experiment these last three years. People think about God all the time. That was shocking to me. They think about God, they think about meaning, they think about purpose all the time. And so to actually have a real conversation about important things is actually refreshing for people even though it sort of cuts against sort of the cultural mandate to never talk about the important. Well, this morning, what I want to give you, that was my preamble, is really three non-negotiables of an ambassador. And these are biblical convictions that have just been forged in me over the last three years through countless interactions. And so if you want an outline, this is it. You're going to get three points. And um, uh, they're biblical they're so simple, but I believe it's as practical as it gets. So, first non-negotiable of an ambassador. Silence is not an option. Silence is not an option. Let's look at a piece of scripture. I'm preaching, so I should probably do so. Mark 8, 34 to 38. And, and here in the context, Jesus has just... Um, spoken about the fact that he's going to die. He's, he's ministering here about 25 miles north of, of Galilee and, um, and shared with his disciples, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die and then I'm going to rise. And, it, and, and before we get to this section, Peter, in verse 32, he actually says, Peter took Jesus aside. <laughs> um, which is absurd because he's like, Jesus, can I have a talk with you? 
about you talking about death and suffering and rising. That's not the way this should go. I know, like, you're God, but I know things. I mean, just think about this. And that's when Jesus rebukes him and says, get behind me, Satan. But it's interesting because every time talk, Jesus talks about his death, burial, and resurrection, he then always follows with the cost of following him. And that's what we have here. Beginning here in uh, verse 34, Mark 8, 34 to 38. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can man... For what can a man give in return for his soul? And so Jesus there is confronting the idolatry, really, of possessions. This isn't going to help you in the end for you to gain everything and yet forfeit your soul. You had a great life here. You had much, but you've wasted your life. And so he's confronting the idolatry of, of possessions. And then he goes on for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And so Jesus goes from confronting this idolatry of possessions to really the idolatry of praise. I'm ashamed of you, Jesus. I'm not going to talk about you because I want men to say nice things about me. I want the culture to like me. I want the city to embrace me. Let me suggest that idolatry, the great idolatry of the church in our nation, is just this. It's the idolatry of praise, that we would, we would be liked. We would be applauded by the world. That we would be seen as evolved humans, good humans, in touch with culture. And cool, without trying to be cool. And because we desire the applause, we want to fit in so desperately, we go silent. We go silent. Or we alter the gospel. We change it. We try to make it more palatable that we might be loved by our city. Culture has always been anti-God. Um, I don't think we should be chronological snobs and think, oh, the church has it so difficult here and you know, the 21st century. I mean, do you want to be there in the second century? Do you want to be in Nero's garden where they're putting Christians up on posts and torching them for the garden parties? I mean, it's always been difficult for God's people to be serious about him and to proclaim that. And yet, I believe what's different in our age is that the church is very quickly compromising and we are quickly becoming quiet, and we're becoming silent, and we're altering a gospel that's been once for all delivered. And what we're doing is we're taking things that God says, this is sin that I died for to redeem you, and we're saying, actually, God, we don't need you. Jesus, we don't need the cross, because we can redeem the sin. And it's not the activity of the world that's the egregious piece for me. Um, it's the churches. When, when we alter the gospel, we're not actually making it more inclusive. We're actually making it more exclusive. Because what we've done is essentially we've said the gospel is for insiders only. I will not give you the dignity or the opportunity to repent of your sin. I'm telling you it's okay. That's an exclusive gospel. That is not an inclusive gospel. Jesus said the wages of sin is death. But I'm afraid and so I hedge and lie and tell you all's good. 
David's been taking you guys through the prophets. I don't know if he hit Ezekiel, but there were issues going on <laughs> in that day as in today. And I, I think this sentiment speaks to what presently we have going on, Ezekiel thirty-three seventeen. Yet your people say the way of the Lord is not just when it is their own way that is not just. God, we're more evolved than you. We know better. Church, I get it. I want to be liked, too. I want to be liked. I picked up a gal a few months back. Grew up in Chicago. I grew up in Chicago. Man, we had instant rapport. It was great. We were just like chumming it up. And uh, we passed by a church that had a banner for Young Life. And immediately, she's like, young life, they're bad. They brainwash children. Okay. Uh Huh. I mean, I wasn't about to defend young life at that moment. That wasn't, you know. And I'm praying the whole time, God, don't let her ask me what I used to do. And we're driving, we're chumming it up. Um... Man, and she just, she was fit to be tied about. She kept kind of like referencing Christians, how they hate homosexuals. And and I'm just like, you know, when your Uber driver sees there's still like 10 minutes left on the ride and he's speeding, that's because he wants to get you out of the car. Um, And sure enough, she said, so what'd you do before Uber? Like, like, no. And I really wanted to lie or sort of brush it off. But I told her, I said, I, I was a pastor. Oh, man. You know, awkward moments? Awkward, like, dinner party from the office kind of moments? Like, awkward. And she's like, oh, oh, but you're one of those cool pastors. And I said, I don't, I mean, I I hope so. I don't know really what you mean by that. Um, What was interesting is that then led into an actual conversation, um, which sometimes it doesn't. Um, but it did. And it was so hard for this woman to dislike me because we had such good rapport and there was such a connection. And by the time we got to the end of the ride, she had accepted the fact that I can believe something different than her and not hate her. And it was beautiful. And we agreed that the next time I pick her up, we will continue the conversation. Um, God gives me those moments, which are, it's a gift from him. But I'm tempted to be silent is my point. I understand. You know, here are the facts. Jesus loved perfectly. He was as winsome as a person gets. He was perfect in compassion, kindness. And yet when he opened his mouth, what happened? He was executed. That's who we follow. No, Jay, you don't understand. Jesus was just misunderstood. No, he wasn't. In fact, in John 7, 7, Scripture says clearly the world hates, Jesus says the world hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. That's pretty straightforward. That's the bad news prior to the good news. He didn't share that to condemn, he shared that to rescue. Church, the world will never be friends with those who are devoted to Jesus. So, Peter put it in 1 Peter 4, verse 3, for the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and, you, and they malign you. You ever found like, when you don't participate in evil, that you're kind of put on the outside? Any of you ever felt that? few of you? I mean, hope all of us at some point. Oh, you're not going to participate in this. So you get mocked, you get shunned, you get ignored, you get disinvited, you get labeled. It's very difficult. One of the things, you know, that I've learned is pretty much what keeps the city going is alcohol, pot. I mean, everything socially revolves around alcohol. It just does. You know, cocktail hour, dinner party, lunch appointment, 
you know, weekend, I mean, holiday, it's everything. Scripture doesn't say don't drink. I'm not, you know, I don't. <laughs> um, and I have friends that do, and they can handle it in a way that's great. And, and, but if you break out of the system, it's very difficult. And um, I think it screams, man, this place is needed. You need this place. You need one another for community, for fellowship, for encouragement. We can't remain silent. Look at Romans 10 if you have that. This is a wonderful section of Scripture right in really the meat of Romans related to God's sovereignty, Romans 9 through 11. And smack in the middle, Romans 10, Paul explains how people come to faith in Jesus. So he's talking about God's sovereignty as a context, and yet here's how it actually works on the horizontal. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And now what Paul does is he explains how it actually works in real time. Verse 14, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have not whom they have never heard. And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. So Paul gives us a series here of five necessary steps for a person to come to Jesus. And he does it in reverse order. He says, first, someone has to be sent. Then they have to open their mouth. They have to preach. They have to proclaim good news. The recipient has to hear then believe in order to call out to Jesus for rescue. And so the critical question for us is, how does this work without our participation? It doesn't. That's the point. Well, Jay, I, I know you're like a really hip uber pastor. It's so unique. I'm just going to applaud you. And David, he gets paid the big dollars to do what he does. So I'm going to applaud him. I'm, but me, I'm, I'm just me. I, I'm not been sent. Yes, you have. We're in this together. In fact, Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 at the end, verse 20, calls you an ambassador. Verse 19 2 Corinthians 5.19 says you've been entrusted with a message of reconciliation. That's all of us. And we know it's all of us because up in 2 Corinthians 5.17 it says if anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. If anyone, anyone, are you in Christ this morning? Then you are anyone. This pertains to you. Have you ever met or heard of a mute ambassador? They don't exist. Where do ambassadors do their work? In foreign countries. They represent another nation, another kingdom, the leadership, the sovereignty, the ethic, the joy, the joy of that place. Yeah. They do their work in a foreign country. Are we home yet? No. If we're not home, that means we're on the job. That's what that means. Life is ministry. Life is ministry. This is not intended to be heavy-handed because I believe there's great joy in that. Man. As awful as it is to sit in your driver's seat for sometimes 10 to 12 hours a day, there's joy because I'm interacting with people about important things. Yeah. You know, there's great mystery in Scripture related to the election of God and the accountability of man. I just want you to know the Bible teaches both. That's a, other, that's a other, kind of a whole other sermon, but it teaches both, and I just want to say sovereignty is not an excuse for silence. God's sovereignty, it undergirds our activity, is what it does, that some will actually respond Jesus gave Paul a vision when he was in Corinth. Can you imagine having to minister in Corinth? Imagine the church, how jacked up it was, you know? Um, it was reflecting a city, 
a place. So imagine how bad that place was. The decadence, the indulgence, the excess. And I'm sure Paul's thinking, what am I doing here? And in Acts 18, God gives Paul this vision, hey, I got people in the city. For those who know the word, do you recall that? I've got people in the city. And he's talking about people that have yet to repent and trust in Christ as their Savior. And that energized Paul that God was at work. He, in fact, stays another year and a half in that city after that vision is given to him. I need this. You need this. Because is it discouraging to be a believer in this city ever? Yes. Do you ever feel alone? Yes. Do you ever wonder, is God going to rescue anyone? Yes. So we need the sovereignty of God to promise us that some will respond. And you know, God loves to use us. God loves to use people. In his sovereignty, this is the mystery. He, he loves to use people. That's his pattern in accomplishing his purposes. From creation, he said, Adam, name the animals. You get to be a participant here. The incarnation, Mary, you need to be the conduit for me. Inspiration, apostles, prophets, carried along by the Holy Spirit. God just didn't like, and like throw down golden tablets. And then when it comes to evangelism, God continues to use people. God is making his appeal through us. Well, dang it, because I'm afraid. Me too. I don't want to be up here with a, with a pretense of bravado that this is just, I'm fearless. I just know who walks with me. And the gravity of forever continues to like work upon me. So I'm afraid, not as much today as I was yesterday, but I still have my moments. Um, can I give you guys a promise? It's from Hebrews 13, 6. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? I mean, what can man do to me? What can man do to us? Exclude us? I mean, kill us? I mean, they're just ushering us home. What can man do to you? Christ says to you, fear not. Fear not. I'm with you. And I would say practically on this front, courage is contagious. To speak is contagious. Pastor David and Pastor Ryan, when they were out, they like handed out 750 inv invitations to Alpha. I don't know where they were, probably South Lake Union, I'm assuming, and wow, he's, they're, they're breaking a cultural rule there. Who cares? I mean, heaven is forever. Okay, God, David was a little courageous. I mean, maybe I can be a little courageous. You see a friend, you see, you see, you know, you see a brother, you see a sister. The church, it should, it, it should have that effect. We, we borrow courage from one another. So we need this gathering because the stakes are forever. Okay, second point. <laughs> We're going to crank. I'm so sorry. Uh, silence is not an option. And secondly, we need to make the gospel personal. We need to make the gospel personal because it is. Paul said in 1 Timothy 1, 15, the saints trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am foremost. Paul didn't just give the objective facts about the gospel. Yeah, it, it, it rests on a historical event 2,000 years ago. But notice Paul inserts himself here. He says, I am the foremost. This is liberating for us. Some of you are fearful to share the gospel because you're like, I don't know what to do. I learned the Romans Road when I was in youth group. I have no idea what to do after all sin or all fall short. Or maybe you have some other kind of thing in your mind, but share your story. There's something very powerful in your subjective experience to be personally forgiven, to have experienced the kindness of the living God. 
There's power when you talk to somebody about a God who's alive and real to you. There's power as we share. I'm not telling you, when I, when I share good news, I'm not telling you about a restaurant I've not eaten at. I'm telling you, yes, that creme brulee donut at General Porpoise, it's so worth the calories. Go there. I'm not telling you to go to a doctor that hasn't helped me. No, he worked on me, and he helped me, and he healed me. I was blind. I was broken. I was fearful. Church, the gospel is beautiful. It's like a wedding feast. It's like a pearl of unmatched value. You would give everything in exchange for that. Well, Jay, you, you make the gospel sound attractive. It is. I'm intimidated. Then talk about the beauty of the gospel in your life. What has the Lord done for you? How have you experienced his presence, his mercy, his grace, the fact that he abundantly, extravagantly pardons? It's like the woman at the well. Let me tell you about a man. He knew everything I did and he didn't condemn me. This gives weight to our words. It's our experience. Make the gospel personal. Because it is. It is. Life is too short not to talk about the important. David has showed you the testimony of Tracy at her baptism. There's power there. The best year of her life was the year where she was in that posture of total surrender to the Lord Jesus. It's beautiful. Here's the truth Church, 1 John 5, 12 says, whoever has a son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life, period. If Jesus is your savior, that's the most important thing. At the end of your life, that's all that matters. Not the possessions, not the praise. Hebrews 9, 27 says, man dies once and then faces judgment. Karma's a lie. Karma is a lie. You don't get to come back and do it again. I talked to so many Hindus on this. And I've asked them to a person, and I just simply ask questions. I say, do you believe that? That's it. You would be surprised at the number of Hindus that say, no, I don't, really. When you ask them just an honest question. And by the way, karma is a horrible doctrine to live under. Because what it says is basically you get what you gave. Your kid gets hit by a car, it's your fault. You have done something in your past life or in this life. It's your fault. I explained this to a Hindu just recently. And by the end of it, he said, you know what? I like Jesus' doctrine of providence more than that one of karma. So we have to tell them. Make the gospel personal. Here is, this is for free. But this is, this is the goodness. This is the thing I probably learned I don't know, and I'm working on, but making the gospel personal, it's not just telling someone, you know, Christians believe. There's a time and a place for that, but when you're conversing with someone, it's not Christians believe that, that Jesus died for sinners. It's not even, take another step, it's not even like, I believe that Jesus died for you. It's getting to that, that, that space of, 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 of intimacy and saying, Jesus died for you. Those are powerful words. Have you ever said that to anyone? Oftentimes we kind of step back and we make it a little bit like theoretical, theological. The Bible says, nothing wrong with that, but I'm suggesting get a little closer because there's power in that. Make the gospel personal. Third point, silence is not an option. Make the gospel personal. Thirdly, abiding is everything. Gee, I thought this was about being an ambassador and sharing the faith. Well, it is. Abiding's everything. You cannot live out the mission of God if you're not deeply connected to him. You know the scriptures in John 15 about the vine and the branches. Without being connected, you don't bear fruit, much fruit. It's simple, it's clear. God's a vine, Jay, you're the branch. If I'm daily connected, I'm nourishing on the vine, then life is poured in me so that life can be produced through me. It's so simple. 
You know, preachers have a few applications they come to every time they preach. And this is one of them. Read your Bible. I've never heard that. That's, whoa, man. Can, I, can somebody give me a pen? I'm gonna, how do you spell that? B, I, abide, abide. It's so simple. You know, the question I get asked most when I talk about this stuff is, how do you start a conversation with people? I don't have a formula. I don't have like a little shtick. Um, but I'll answer this question two ways. It's the scene and the unseen. The unseen will get into the abiding piece, but the scene. The scene is, and this, I'll just quickly move through this, but people always ask. The scene, how do I start this? I'm a curious person. I ask questions. A good question is like a doorknob into the room of a person's life. It sounded so good, I didn't make that up. I heard it somewhere. Um, <laughs> I think that's a Kellerism. I'm not sure. Uh, but I agree. I ask questions. I mean, the Proverbs, Proverbs 25 says, the purposes of a man's heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Good questions do this. I ask and catch this. I listen. I don't ask and then do this. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Which is completely dangerous because I'm supposed to be driving. I work at listening. And it's an art that you can grow in. It's a discipline. I labor to listen well. I would say also, how do these conversations start? I'm a curious, or I'm a curiosity um, to most folks in Seattle. I'm a curiosity piece. I mean, I've been married 26 years. That usually comes out, oh, you married, da, da, da. yeah, I've been married 26 years. People don't even know what marriage is anymore. I mean, seriously, like, it's not even on the radar for most. I mean, they're like, they're in their mid-30s and they haven't even decided if they're gonna seriously date. <laughs> marriage? And they ask if I have kids. That comes up, I tell them I have a bunch. They always wanna know, what's a bunch? And then I tell them, I say, I have seven. And then they say, no, you're, you're fooling me. <laughs> they don't say fool. Uh, I said, I'm not fooling you. <laughs> no, really, I have seven. And then they always respond the same way. They say, HS, right? Not Holy Spirit. They say Holy something else to a person. It's the same. So I'm a curiosity piece. And then sometimes that gets into then more of my story, like, oh, seven, and they find out I've adopted, and they're like, you've adopted? Like, why'd you do that? <laughs> I mean, we live in a city, right? I mean, I don't even know where the children are. There's some here, but they hide. And uh, I say, we adopt. And this is probably the most curious thing where they just sort of are struck. I'll tell them, I, I said, well, my wife, she thought that she heard God tell her. That's all I'll say. I can just hear the, in the backseat, oh man, do I want to talk about like God or do I want to talk about adoption? Like what, which way should I go here? There's a fork in the road. <laughs> Because I'm talking to them about God, a God who I believe is real, and I'm telling you what, that's a curiosity piece to people. Because we live in a, in a place where there's such light conviction on everything. You're a curiosity piece as you speak about a God who is real. That's the scene. I could talk more about that, but the unseen is this. This is the secret sauce. I spend time with the Lord. I spend time with Jesus. How have you grown as an ambassador? I spend time with the Lord. He speaks to me through the pages of a book. I'm desperate to hear his voice. When you hear the voice of God for yourself, there's nothing better. You're in a place of weeping, of turmoil. You get in and you're in the Psalms and you hear God speak and it's like life. It's the best. To hear God speak is the best. And because I'm in a state where for me to function in the morning is almost impossible, it takes me about two hours just to figure out if I'm going to get breakfast so I can sit and I can open the book and I can just soak. And as a follower of Christ, you desire that? I know you do. But you hear the voice of opposition when you wake up. I hear it too. I want to turn on Sports Center or the news or 
Look at how many people have affirmed me. <laughs> okay, none of you do that. Um, but man, there's nothing like spending time with the Lord. That is the unseen. And let me just say this. Ministry has quietly increased in my life. Commensurate with the time I commune with the Lord. I think I get tired of, of, of pastors going, you got to be on mission. you got to be on mission. you got to... No, you've got to be in relationship. Mission then occurs. Trust me. When I'm with the Lord, those are the moments when I have the sense of like, I need to send this person a text right now. I need to share a verse with this person right now. I need to like reach out and grab time with this individual right now. That's when it occurs. We're so tethered and then fragmented and we have to have that space. And whatever it is, you gotta fight for that. I don't know what to read. Talk to your pastor. I just commend you, man, at least a psalm a day and hear from God and then chew on that. Chew on his promises. Speak true things. Preach to yourself. Because God knows, man, this place, this city will tell you a whole bunch of nonsense all the time. Spend time with the Lord. Your heart will expand for people. I drove a Muslim family. I'm almost done. I drove a Muslim family um, just recently and um, sweetest family, kindest family. It was such a short ride. And the little girl, they had like a little girl in the back and she had like these ringlets in her hair. And then like, I'm, I'm like a sucker for like curls because I had a, like a curly daughter. Um, I have six daughters, so there's got to be a curly one in there. Um, a couple, but, and I'm just, I just melted. Like I was thinking about my kid when she was that age. And, and then all of a sudden she like, would you like a piece of gum? <laughs> I'm like, yes, yes I would. And I have a piece of gum for you. We traded gums. And then I dropped him off, and I didn't get to, to talk about Jesus. And I was like, Lord, this kind family, they don't know you. And I prayed, God, would you, would you rescue them? Would you come to them in a dream? Lord is doing some crazy things in the Muslim world. There's a, there's a book by Tom Doyle, Dreams, Visions in the Muslim World. It talks about some of that. Um, I have a pastor friend, church I normally kind of help out at, and uh, he met a man a month ago, came up to him and said, are you Pastor Al? He said, yes, I am. The Lord told me to come and talk to you. Jesus came in, in my dreams and said, you would tell me about Jesus. Are you Pastor Al? He said, yes, I am. That's what's going on. I pray, God, would you rescue this family? You know, it's like the people that we interact with such a short time. Beautiful, it says, are the feet of him, of her who brings good news. The one who resolves, I'm not going to be as silent as I've been. The one who talks about the kindness that they could never repay. Friends, this is where the joy is. It truly is. And I'll end with this story. My ministry began, and I still remember this, this young gal. She was 25 and this is probably the first month of, of driving where I knew like God's doing something here. And we began to talk about, well, she was the entertainment in the car uh, at the beginning of the evening. Um, to, it was an Uber pool ride and there were some other girls in the back. It was like the end of the night. It was like one, two in the morning, taking them home. And these two girls in the back are just baiting this girl in the front who's just drunk out of her mind. And they're just kind of like, they love to see the stupid things she's saying and it's just entertainment. And so, and this gal in the front was just obnoxious. Uh, she was like playing with my stereo and that's like the worst thing you can do um, <laughs> to an Uber pastor because she's like, this is the best song, turn it up. And I'm going to turn it up, but you didn't give me the chance. Um, these two girls in the back then get out. I'm stuck with this gal and I'm just like, oh, this is going to be crazy when you get this gal home. And then we just get talking and, and, and I don't know how it came up, but I said, you know, I, we're talking about alcohol and yeah, she's loving it and she's just, I say, yeah, I don't, I don't drink anymore. That's all I said. And immediately, it was just like, she got sober. She said, how did you do it? I've been trying. I've been to these programs and they did not work. I've been drinking since college. I drink when I go out. I drink when I stay home. 
I cannot stop. And it's ruining my life. I said, the Lord. The Lord got a hold of me. His power is in my life, and he gave me that capacity to say, don't need it. I said, do you want me to pray for you? She said, yes. We get, finally get to her place. So I began to pray, and I, I'm believing that God's going to meet her need, so I'm praying, God, would you rescue this gal? Would you heal her? Would she know your power, Lord Jesus? Um, and as I'm praying, she grabs my hand, which was a little bit unusual. Remember, I've been in the confines of, of a church building. It's very safe there, right? I don't have people grab my hand, and then she puts it to her face. I'm like, I'm just going to keep going with this guy. <laughs> and she just begins to weep. And my hand is just like dripping with her tears as I'm praying that God would meet her need and, and heal her addiction. I share that because that's what this is about. Like, you have Christ. And the goodness for the follower of Christ is to be part of what he's doing, is to be useful. I'm not leading the church, but the Lord is using me, and praise God, it's good. It's good. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for this time. We love you. Amen. David? We remember what Jason said, that Christ died for you, and he died for me. And there's so much in this city, so many ways to get lost. And this is a reminder that no one is ever too lost. No one has ever done anything for which Christ has not died. And if you believe that, that, that Jesus has died for you, you coming up to this table, ripping off a piece of the bread, dipping it in the cup, and eating it is your proclamation, is you not being silent, that God has done that for you, that Christ has died for you, that your sin no longer separates you from God. And that's the message that we want our city to know. And so we proclaim it here. We practice being bold and coming up front and saying, Jesus died for me. And then hopefully we go from this place and we continue to say that. Jesus has died for me. And Jesus has died for you. So when you're ready, you can come to this table and participate in the body of Christ and the blood of Christ.